Hey folks, it's been a while since I've done a a Facebook Live. This is Dr. Tasson. It's an OR day today, and I had two really interesting cases that I wanted to show you. This first one is a coil. This is the right fallopian tube right here, and you can see that right here the tube makes a sharp divergence, but there's a coil sticking right out of the tube. Um, Same, same picture just a little bit more in depth but that coil is poking out right through the fallopian tube and you can see here on the left side there's nothing so that's what a tube is supposed to look like comes off the uterus right here comes down um but this guy right here it's like ta-da it's poking right through that obviously can't feel very good now i would say that if a woman went or if a guy went in and i've said this a million times before but if a guy went into the office and he's like hey doc you know that uh, thing you stuck in my scrotum, my vas def, as it were? Um, and he said, yeah, well, look at this. And the doc went, oh, my Lord, Jason, what is that sticking out of your vas deferens? Well, that's the coil that you put in my vas, and I think it's hurting. It'd probably be like in the operating room later that week removing this thing. This lady's been complaining of right-sided pelvic pain for years and was told that this couldn't possibly be causing her problem. Obviously it was. So let's move on to the next case. This is another lady who's been told that she has pain on the right side. And look at this. So you can see the tube is right here. Normal looking tube, no problems. Right here, you have an Escher coil. Basically, this is the middle core with the coil wrapped around it. Not even near the tube. Basically nowhere near the tube. So um, this was also told that could not possibly be causing her pain. Now, I'm not sure if you understand, but uh, this looks pretty painful. Um, This is not supposed to be there. If you had an IUD that had been shoved through your uterus and it was poking out like this, everybody would probably say, oh gosh, yeah, that could hurt. But this poor lady, again, years, was being told that this doesn't hurt. Um, As far as Nat's asking, um, are they fitted wrong or is it that they migrate? Well, that's the great debate. Um, this is it in a different angle. My guess, and this is just my professional opinion, you can see the coil is nowhere near this fallopian tube. My guess is that this one was placed wrong. This one was probably not placed correctly um, because the tube entrance is right here. This other one, this second one, the first one that I showed you, this one right here, that's probably more of a migration type of, a, of an environment. I mean, again, it's all hearsay. Uh, I can't tell you for sure, but this one to me looks like it was just put in in the wrong place. So this is a foreign body. The way that these coils work is they cause an inflammatory response. They're coated with polyethyl trephalate fibers, uh, nickel, uh, titanium, nitinol, and the way that these work is they cause an inflammatory process. So you can imagine this thing sticking out into the pelvis, um, causing inflammation, Uh, but the problem is they don't know when to turn off. So, um, they cause inflammatory process in the pelvis. It's not in the uterus. It's not in the tube. It's in the pelvis. So basically this poor lady has had issues for years being told that, um, it wasn't the coil when obviously it was. So this is just another view. This thing is sticking out. This is the inner coil, the inner core piece that's coated with the polyethyltrephalate fibers, which is basically like polyester. So this causes an inflammatory reaction. Um, uh, Rachel's asking, what's my recommended sterilization technique? Um, Right now, Rachel, I do uh, basic old school, sorry, my hair looks horrifying. I'm not a model, I just look like one. Um, My preferred method right now is to do a laparoscopic tubal sterilization with uh, bipolar cautery. Um, it doesn't use any foreign devices or materials. It's just uh, uh, bipolar uh, heat and it cauterizes the fallopian tube. Uh, Rachel also said, I have Paragard but want something permanent. So yeah, um, Paragard's great if you don't like it because it only lasts for 10 years. If you want something permanent, I would go with either a laparoscopic sterilization by um, uh, burning or uh, maybe excising a piece of the tube. But a lot of doctors will still use something called Filshi clips. So those are also a a metal clip that goes on the tube. And if you don't want that, you wanna make sure that you tell them that you don't want a clip because 
it's a foreign body as well. It doesn't necessarily have the same inflammatory response that uh, an Esher coil does simply because that's how they were made to work. Um, the, 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 the clips, the Filshi clips, the Hulk clips don't have that same um, reaction. So um, the other thing is what I've been finding is a lot of women that are coming to me uh, for removals. I also do hormone panels on everybody. And I've been finding a lot of estrogen dominance, progesterone deficiency, and testosterone deficiency. Now this, I can't say that it's related to the coils per se, but uh, we know that some of the chemicals are endocrine disrupting, and uh, it could just be perimenopause or menopause or symptoms of that nature as well. But point being is, if you have uh, coils, uh, probably a good idea to get your hormones tested as well, just to see where you're at, especially if you're having irregular periods, weight gain, bleeding, uh, decreased libido, uh, anything along those lines. It may not be related to the coils, but it could be possibly due to hormonal imbalance. And you can always go to my website at uh, tassonemd.com and uh, the number one on one consultations. If you're out of state or if you're in state and you don't want to drive, you can always do an online consult with me uh, for hormone imbalances or the Esure removal. I'll give you all kinds of information. Uh, the office phone number is 512-956-0296. And like I said, again, you know, if you feel like it's, it's these, these cases that I'm showing you are not necessarily run of the mill. So Normally when I do a case, I don't see a coil sticking out like this. Maybe one out of every 15 or 20 will have a perforation. And I just, I had five cases today and I only saw this on two of them. But you know, when it rains, it pours. And um, I had two in one day. Both of these women have coil perforations or migrations on the right side. And both of them had pain on the right side. Uh, so I would say, um, uh, this is probably why. So, point being, there's my buffalo head. I moved into a new house, and I have got my buffalo head all set up. Um, so, Megan's saying, I'm having my hysterectomy tomorrow. Uh, just leaving my ovaries. Have you also dealt with Esure issues and a sling, too? It was the sling, an issue, along with the Esure. Is that common for both? I have put in slings. Uh, I put in a few in my day. I don't use them anymore because obviously it's a foreign body as well and it can cause a foreign body reaction. That's how the sling works is it causes inflammation. The problem with the sling is those are really hard to get out because your body grows new tissue over that sling weave and so it makes it really difficult for that to come out. You have to go to a, a specialist to have that removed as well. So um, is the pain local? Uh, usually they'll point to the side, at least what I see. Some women are complaining of back pain, um, vaginal uh, pain, but you know, it's hard to tell with the pelvis because sometimes you'll feel back pain and it could, it could be back pain, right? Um, but it could be ovarian, it could be bladder, it could be coming from other areas of the pelvis as well, uh, diverticulosis or diverticulitis. Um, you know, things like that. So it's kind of hard sometimes to localize the pain to just where the coil is. And actually, sometimes when a person is having, say, an appendicitis attack, which is on the right, when it initially starts, they'll feel it on the left. So there isn't always a, a correlation to the pain, but towards the end, if the pain's been there a long time um, and your body's used to it, it will localize after a while. Um, uh, Zun Gonzalez, hey Dr. Stone, we'll see you Thursday. Thank you for all you do. Well, I will see you Thursday then too, apparently. Uh, glad to have you. East Sisters, love you, Doc. Thank you for all you do. Thank you, Laura. I love the uh, hearts and the, the well wishes. Very nice. Um, but uh, basically at this point, I've done over 600, close to 700 of these now. And I just want you all to know that it's not all in your head. I, I do think that sometimes, um, a couple of things. First of all, not every woman that has an Esher coil has problems. I would say there's a lot of women that don't, maybe, maybe a majority of women that don't. But there are a lot of women that do. And if you figure we put a probably close to 750,000 of these or a million of these in in the last 12, 14 years, that um, maybe there's a lot of women that are having problems. And even if it's only 20%, 
that's still close to 200,000 women that are out there having problems. So I think you, you want to be persistent. And one thing I'm gonna leave you with is there's anybody, any, any OBGYN can do a proper hysterectomy. The, the, the times that I get concerned and I speak up is when women are having the salpingectomy or just having their tubes removed. And this is what I'm seeing. I just did a case last week where a woman had actually had a hysterectomy and she still had about one and a half coils inside of her. But if, if you're having just your tubes removed, do a couple of things for me. Make them draw you a picture to show you how they're gonna remove the tube from the uterus. Anything that involves cutting the tube open and pulling the coil or simply cutting the tube off of the uterus, I don't think that's a good way to do things. That's just my opinion, but I don't think it's a good way to do things. I'm seeing fragments, I'm seeing pieces, I'm seeing all kinds of crazy stuff. Um, uh, the other thing would be to ask them how many they've done because you don't want to be somebody's first case. I don't think you get really good until you've done about 30. Obviously, I had to have my first case. Uh, Jen Harmon is on. Uh, amazing as always. Actually, Jen was one of my few uh, early cases. And uh, Jen, as not, you may not be aware, but Jen lost a ton of weight after she had the coil removed, um, which uh, is another thing. Not everybody has that, unfortunately. But uh, for her, a lot of hard work, a lot of uh, paid off. But I think sometimes the coils and the, the hormone imbalance, maybe not the coil, but the hormonal imbalance can can cause issues with weight loss. So, um, Jen, thank you so much. Uh, it's good seeing you. I haven't seen you in a few years. Um, so, make them draw you a picture. The only way that I think it's a good way to remove these is to core around the coil, cutting into the uterus, uh, down into the endometrial cavity, and removing the coil still inside the tube in one piece. Also, if they're not doing an x-ray, even if it's a hysterectomy, even if it's a hysterectomy, if they're not doing an x-ray before the surgery, either demand one or ask them why they're not doing one. Because how can they know where they are in your body and how can they know how many are in there? I just had a lady do a CAT scan or she had a CAT scan the other day. She has three. So if you don't know there's three in there, then you don't know there's three that need to come out. If you're having the salpingectomy or just having the tubes removed, they need to do an x-ray while you're still in the operating room. While you're still in the operating room asleep, they need to do an x-ray so that you know that the coils are completely removed. Um, Sayo Davila is also saying she had a lot of weight loss after the issue removal. Obviously, I wouldn't have surgery just because you're thinking you'll get a weight loss, but in some women it's working. How did you master this? And I'm reading a lot of other doctors have a hard time. How did I master it? I just, I just did, did it. It's just sheer volume and persistence and um, you know, doing 700 of these, you get good at it. If you do something that many times, you just, you tend to get good at it. And it's not easy, it's not an easy case to do. And the reality is, um, it takes a while to learn. Why is the Paragard only good for 10 years? What exactly stops working? The problem with the Paragard being for 10 years is that the research that they did on it only went to 10 years. They are currently, I believe, looking at 15. I think they're trying to study it, but obviously if you're gonna do a study uh, on a product that is gonna last 15 years, it takes a sh I was gonna say a swear word. It takes a long time to do it. Um, so I think they are currently looking to see if it'll go for 15 years. But currently, the, the studies they did, the FDA was with 10 years, so that's why they, that's why they said that. Um, master, that's such a perfect term. Master what? Master clap? Because I don't know what the clapping hands mean. But, uh, so any questions before I get off? I don't want to bore you all. I just wanted to get on because it had been a few weeks and I haven't looked at any, uh, showed you any cases, and these were two interesting cases. Um, you are amazing. If you were in Dallas, you would be my doctor. Well, Dallas isn't that far. Dallas is only a few hours away, and I have a lot of women that come down from Dallas, so feel free. I'm not going anywhere. I just signed a three-year lease on my new office, which, by the way, is at 4600 Mueller Boulevard in Austin. I'm all by myself now, have my own space. It's great. We got Kim back, we got Maddie, I got uh, Robin, 
Um, we got a new uh, person answering the phones named Victoria, who's learning the ropes, so please be kind to her. Um, when in OR, what can you detect tumors, fibroids, endometriosis, cancer? Uh, I'm not exactly sure what you mean, but um, when we're in the operating room, we can see your uterus, we can see endometriosis, uh, we can see fibroids most of the time if they're on the outside of the uterus. Um, sometimes hard to see cancer um, unless it's really bad and you put the camera in, you think that that might be what it is. Uh, Trina, thank you. It's been a while since I've seen you. Uh, Ms. Garcia, I have the Esher and want it removed. So first step is to get an x-ray. The first step, yeah, I mean, the f that would be, my initial workup obviously is a history. I order x-rays, I order hormones, and obviously an exam, either uh, when you initially see me or when you come in for your pre-op. Um, Megan, you're welcome. Uh, Christy, good to see you again. I'm the best. I wouldn't go that far, but I will take it. I'm, my New Year's resolution is to learn how to take a compliment. So thank you. I appreciate that. Um, so any other questions? I'm going to log off because I got some things to do. Are you, uh, Wimberly, oh, that's nice. That's really great. I'm glad to hear that. It's been a while since I've seen you, and I'm so glad that you feel better. Um, and it's good to hear from you again, by the way. And you're so close. You should come visit. Um, so, uh, anything else? Any other questions? I know. Thanks, Heather. Thanks for the recommendation. Uh, Natalie's on here. She's a really good friend of mine from Australia, and she's been telling me that for two years, and I tend not to listen. So, um, I'm a little stubborn, actually. Believe that. So, uh, have a good weekend. Have a good Friday. Enjoy the day. And I will talk to you all later. Bye.